Welcome to Summer Splash. Are y'all excited to be here tonight? All right, I know, I am so excited. It's so good to see all your beautiful faces. I just loved just kind of looking over and seeing all of you worship tonight. It's just like every, people were just so engaged and I don't know, I just, I got teary. It just made me tear up. There's nothing more beautiful than women of God just standing up and praising the Lord. And so I'm just excited and just anticipating all that God wants to do tonight. But we also have lots of ladies joining in with us because we have our Haslett campus, our McKinney campus. Shout out to all of you girls at our campuses that are joining in with us. So good, and all of those that are tuning in online, we're so glad to have you with us tonight. But what about our worship team though, girls? Can we just give it up for our worship team? I think I'm a little biased, but they're pretty amazing. But I am excited for all of you that have come tonight. Maybe some of you are guests. You know, the thing I love about that video testimony is they said not only did they come to an event or come to a service, it says they came and they got connected. And that's really my heart for you tonight, is that you don't just come and experience a service and leave and think, wow, that was great, but that you get connected to other girls. And so I encourage you, it might be a little bit out of your comfort zone, it may take a little bit of like stepping out and like kind of getting over your fear, but if you came, especially if you came alone tonight, I just encourage you, go meet somebody. Listen, when you're standing in line at the food trucks, you'll have plenty of time to meet some other girls or on the dance floor. And if you came with friends tonight, but you see somebody that seems to be alone, I really encourage you to introduce yourself to them, to meet them, to invite them in. And so, cause that's what it's all about. Not just coming to a conference type feel, which we're not a conference, we're a family, but also getting connected to other girls because I truly believe that we're better together. Y'all believe that? All right. But it is my privilege and my honor to introduce to you tonight our guest speaker. And honestly, she's not a guest at all. Julie Mullins is my friend, and honestly, she is the sweetest. When she comes up and speaks, you're gonna think, is she really that nice? Yes, she is. Behind the scenes, she really is that nice. I remember when I met her years ago, she just felt like a kindred spirit. You ever have friends that you just, you meet somebody and you're like, oh, I know we're gonna get along. And she's just always been like that. She and her husband, Todd, um, are great friends to Jeff and I. They pastor Christ Fellowship Church in South Florida. So they're really roughing it for Jesus in South Florida. But they're doing great things, making a great impact. And I know that the word that she has for you tonight is so impactful. So I encourage you to just really like, turn all the distractions off, and get ready because God is gonna come and speak to you tonight through my friend Julie. So if you will give Julie Mullins a warm milestone welcome. Wow, you guys can have a seat. Do you just love your pastor's wife? I mean, when she was saying that about me, that is, when I met Brandy, it was the same. I and mean, we just felt such a kindred spirit. We've met um, Pastor Jeff and, and Brandy. It, we felt like we found our people. We actually thought about changing the name of our church um, from Christ Fellowship to Milestone Southeast or something because we love your church family and we do feel like family. And, um, and honestly, you know, Brandy, the way that she, um, the, the way that she, she's probably the kindest person, genuinely kind genuinely wise and full of integrity. And what God is doing at Milestone Church, it is known across the country and really around the world. It's nothing short of miraculous. And I just wanna honor you. Would you honor, give honor where honor is due by honoring your pastor's wife? And the great thing is she loves you all so much, right? She loves you so much. When, she, when we talk, she talks about you and what God's doing in your lives. And so um, before I jump in, Tonight, um, I just, I always try to just give a little bit of background because I, I met some of you a few years ago, but some of you it's your first time. And, um, and just whenever I meet new friends, I always try to let them know a little bit about me. A little bit about me is that, first of all, is that I am completely deaf in my left ear 
which means that I will most likely ignore this part of the crowd all night long, right? I don't mean to ignore you, I just forget that you're there, right? So you have to make a little bit more noise over here to let me know you're still there and make sure at Hazlitt and McKinney Campus that you're making some noise there or else I might forget that you're there. If you're online, put in some heart emojis, a couple of amens, and, um, and I won't forget about you, right? Another thing about me is that, um, that I would not consider myself a women's conference speaker. I do speak at a lot of women's conferences, but I would say that, um, that I really believe that I'm a church builder, that, that I really believe in building church. I believe that the church still is the hope for the world because Jesus was the hope for the world, and we are his living, breathing body on planet Earth today. We are his hands. We are his feet. And I love the church, and I love your church. I really believe that when the sisters of the house are strong, Right? When they're strong, that, that the church gets stronger. It can move forward faster. And so when, when um, Pastor Brandy asked me to come tonight, it was an easy yes, right? An easy yes, because I love this church. I love what God's doing. And I love the church because when I was walking through the doors as a very broken 13-year-old girl, who, who was living in the aftermath of, of a lot of family trauma, a broken up divorce, and living in all of the insecurity that came after that. I walked through the doors of a church for the very first time, and I found what I did not even know I was looking for. I found people that, that began to just really call out the God thing and, and call out purpose and potential in my life. They, they let me teach the third grade girls Sunday school class. I had no idea that nobody actually wanted to teach the third grade girls Sunday school class, but they let me do it, right? And so they began to, to just speak life over me. And, and those people introduced, before I met Jesus, I met his family. And they introduced me to Jesus, and my life has never been the same since. And I also found, you know, I only showed up that night because I heard that there were going to be some really cute guys there. Right? That was, I didn't know why they had their hands in the air like they didn't care. I didn't know what being saved was. I had no idea. But like I said, I found what I didn't know I was looking for. I found one of those really cute guys. His name was Todd. I met him in the seventh grade. And after dating on and off all the way through high school and college, um, he always says it was more on than off. But I have the microphone. It was definitely more off than on. He finally <laughs> asked me to marry him. We've been married for 37 years. We've been planted in the same church for 40 years. We have one son. I have a family picture. We have one son, um, Jefferson, wanted five, but God God gave me one miracle son, and um, just a few years ago, he married the love of his life, Cassie, and we are, we, we are loving, serving together in South Florida in the church. And so I, the church has marked my life in so many ways. It's events like this that have spoken and parted so much life all through the years. And my prayer is, is that we could just have a little bit of church tonight. I hope, are you okay, okay with that if we have church tonight? Because I know that, that the Holy Spirit is here, and he wants to speak to you tonight. Well, just a few years ago, um, Todd and I led a mission trip to Kenya, Africa. And when we were planning the trip, our mission partners on the ground had asked us when we came over, they said, we want to take you on a safari at the end of your mission trip. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a, a pretty driven person. I was like, no, we don't have time for that. We got to get back and get back to work at the church. And, and they were like, listen, you're coming all the way across the globe to come to Africa. And we want to show you some of the beauty of our country. And so we, you know, we, we decided that, that we would do that. And at the end of our week-long mission trip, um, we'd been serving and, um, and, and really get, we did a women's conference. It was a really beautiful time of ministry. At the very end of the trip, we loaded up in the Jeep that we had been in all week long we loaded up in the jeep and we started to, to started off to the safari and as we drove along it was about a two hour drive we drove onto the masamara reserve and as soon as we we drove onto the reserve it was incredible i mean i literally was just my mind was blown at the beauty there were elephants and giraffes and wildebeest and it was absolutely incredible i was i was in tears over god's creation and as, as we were traveling along, the girl behind me, her name was Juliet, and she said, um, she was our worship leader, she said, you know what, if I see a lion, I am going to scream. And so, we were, that, of course, that's what we were all looking for was the lion. Well, sure enough, you know, just a, a little bit down the path, we saw that the Jeep in front of us had veered off to the side, and, and they was walking, our, our guide was, was walkie-talking back to the guide in front of them, and it was obvious that they were seeing something really great. And so we begin to pull over to the side, and, and the guide tells us, you have to be really, really quiet 
because you don't want to disturb the lions. And so as we pull over to the side, as you can see the Jeep, what, what you're supposed to do is you lift up the top of the Jeep so you can stand up and look and see the lions, right? So, so we were like being quiet and, and making sure that we were all, you know, um, just making sure we were honoring, right, the, the lions that were out there. And so we pull up to the side and we, we go to unhook the, un, unlatch the, the top of the Jeep. And I unlatched my side. As soon as we pushed up the top, something big and furry fell on my head crawled down my shoulder, down my leg. It was a rat. And I'm not kidding, it was this big. The rats in Kenya are a lot bigger. I ran into a girl named Ruth from Kenya last night. I said, was I lying? She said, no, the rats in Kenya are like possums, right? So this possum rat fell on my head and was scurried to the back of the Jeep and I let out the loudest scream that I have ever let out. My husband has never heard me scream like that. And he turns around and he's like, shh. You're going to scare the lions. And I'm like, I'm whispering as loud as I can, it's a rat, it's a rat. Because I'm trying to obey my husband and protect everybody else in the chief. And all of a sudden it hits me. Like there is a rat on the inside and a lion on the outside, right? <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Well, I chose the rat. And so I stayed inside the Jeep. And for the next two hours, two hours, all the girls were standing on the seats. You know, two hours we had, to, we had to drive until we could pull over to a safe spot to get the rat. And so for that entire two hours, I am like consumed. I am thinking that rat's going to come out and get me at any minute. So, I mean, there, outside the window, there are elephants and giraffes and Cape buffaloes and lions, but I'm not seeing any of it. I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing out the side. I'm not seeing out the front. I am consumed with what's going on in the Jeep, right? I, I was so consumed with the rat that I missed the beauty. I was so consumed with the rat that I missed his majesty. The title of my message tonight is Don't Miss His Majesty. Don't miss his majesty. Because here's the deal, is that we can become so consumed with, with the rats in our lives, right? We can, some, we can become so consumed with, with, our, with, with our past hurts, people that have hurt us, and, 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 and we, we, can, we can dwell on the past and, and carry this bitterness and unforgiveness and, and be so consumed that we can get stuck. Or we can get consumed with our, our insecurities because of the lies that, that we believe about ourselves, that we're not good enough or, or smart enough or we're just not enough. And we can become so consumed with our past mistakes and our regrets and think, surely, there's, that God can't use me. Or so consumed with just comparing our lives to everybody else's lives on social media. And, and when we get so consumed with these rats that the enemy sends our way, the, 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 the rats that the enemy sends to us as distractions to keep us living small limited lives. And when we get so consumed with the rats that, that we can lose sight of the reality that, that we have a king, King Jesus, right? And because of what he did on the cross, because of what he did on the cross, that the same power that, that raised Jesus up from the dead actually lives in us, that we have been invited into a kingdom, a spiritual kingdom, where we are no longer limited by our own capacity, by our own strength, by, by, our, by, by, by the things that, that seem to hold us back, that the deposit of the Holy Spirit has been placed in us so that we could live big lives, See, in Revelation, it says that Jesus, he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Those who are with him are chosen. You have been chosen and invited into a spiritual kingdom. Galatians 4, 7 says that, that you have been, you are no longer a slave to anything in your past, but, but you are now God's child. And as his child, you are an heir. You, you have this inheritance that, that Jesus actually shares. He, he shares the wealth of his kingdom. And I love what it says in Psalm 8. It says that, that when, when the psalmist asks, who, who am I, who, am, who are humans, mankind, that you would even be mindful of us? And it says in Psalm 8, it says that God made you only a little lower than God himself. And he crowned you with glory and mad and honor. You, God gave you and me charge over everything that he made. He put all things under our authority. We've been created for authority and, and for influence. And I, I don't know about you, but, but this scripture kind of like trips me up a little bit because when I think about this part where it says that, that we were created just a little lower than God himself, 
I mean, when I think about God, I'm like, he is way up here perfect in all his ways. And I am so far down here with my faults and my failures. And that's how we see it, but that is not how God sees it. And, and you may be here and you may be thinking, but Julie, you don't know. You don't know what I did last Friday night when I wasn't at a women's conference. You, you don't know what I, I said to my husband before I actually came to this conference, right? You, you don't know how I yelled at my kids. You don't know what I thought when I saw her coming here and I made sure I made a beeline to the other side of the building. You, you don't know. And, I said, and it's true. I don't know. I don't know what you said, what you did, what you thought, but God knows it all. And, and he says, it doesn't matter what you've done in your past. Your past does not define you. He says that, that no matter what you've done or, or where you've come from, it says that in Psalm 8, verse 5, that he crowns you. And I just want you to get this visual for a minute because it says that, that this crown, this crown he, 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 he places this crown on your head as a daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that he has chosen you with such value and potential. And this, this crown, it actually, um, it, it's a symbol. I don't know if you guys have noticed that our world seems to be obsessed with royalty, right? I mean, uh, several months back when King Charles like, was, was stepped up and was, had the coronation, there were millions of people across the globe that tuned in. And, and when you think about it, there was nothing that, that King Charles did to even earn that crown. He, he didn't do anything to deserve it. He didn't earn it. He, he couldn't have bought it. The only reason he got that crown is because, he, because of who his dad was and who his parents were. The only reason he got that crown was because he was in line for it. And some of you need to know that you are in line for a crown. You, you are in line for this. See, this crown is this symbol of, of your identity. It was a symbol of, of Prince Charles' identity. It, the coronation ceremony was just the, the moment, the moment that marked the time that he was going to step up to be who he was actually born to be in the first place. And this, this crown is a symbol of identity. You, this, this crown, you, you are a daughter of the king. And it's not, you can't earn it, you, you can't buy it, but just because of who your heavenly father is, you are entitled to it. You are an heir to it. The crown also, it, it comes with territory. Just like when King Charles stepped up to become the king, he actually was, was given lands that Ireland and Scotland, the United Kingdom, the, these lands that he would have leadership and influence over. And I really believe that tonight, that some of you, that, that God is calling you up to, a, to, to new territory, to claim some new territory, new territory of courage and confidence, that he wants to put something in your hand that, that you're going to be able to lead with courage and confidence. I also believe that there is some territory that, that maybe the enemy has taken. Maybe there's some territory in your family or in your relationships or some territory in your mind. And, and I believe that tonight that you're going to get some of that territory back. But the, the crown is also this, this symbol of, of victory. And you know, when I, I first started, when God first started laying this word on my heart about the crown, it was actually a little bit like, um, it was confusing to me because I would not consider myself a girly girl, right? I, I wasn't really into princesses when I was growing up. I was actually more of a sporty girl. And, um, and, and what, what I realized was when I started just studying like the crown and royalty in ancient times and biblical times, that if you wore the crown, that meant that, that you had been through a few battles. That the crown, it isn't this symbol of, of frailty or fragility. It's actually this symbol of victory and authority. To wear the crown, you had to be through some battles. There, there is no crown of victory without a fight. And I believe that tonight, some of you, you're going to get your fight back tonight. Because this is what happens when, when His Majesty King Jesus shows up. Victory follows. Victory is what happens when, when, we, when we stake a claim, when we claim the crown, our identity, the territory, the authority. That the victory is what happens when Jesus shows up. And I love in scripture um, when, when Jesus shows up on planet earth that he was the, the visible image of an invisible God, right? And so when he showed up, if you want to know what God looks like, you just, you just look at Jesus. And when he showed up on earth, that, that his, his ministry was, was marked 
by signs and wonders and miracles. And he was like establishing this spiritual kingdom on earth. And everywhere he went, he was performing these signs and wonders. And they were incredible, but, but they, were, they were just signs. These miracles were a sign pointing to a greater reality, pointing to the character and nature of our God. They were just to grab people's attention so that, that they could be ushered into the spiritual kingdom. And when Jesus was preaching along the Sea of Galilee, we see in Mark chapter 5 that, that his ministry is on fire. All of these miracles and signs are, are happening, and, and he shows up on, on, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and, and there begins to, a crowd begins to assemble. And as he begins to assemble a crowd, there, um, th this, this crowd gathers, and, and all of a sudden a man begin he comes to Jesus and he throws himself at Jesus' feet. His name was Jairus. And everyone in the crowd would have known who Jairus was because Jairus was, was a, a leader in the synagogue and he was well respected. He was, he was known and, and he, was, um, he was honored and he was prominent. But in the same crowd that day, there was another person but when Jairus, when he came to, to threw himself at Jesus' feet, that he humbled himself because he knew that, that he, he, he wanted to ask something of Jesus. He said, Jesus, my, my daughter, my 12-year-old daughter is dying. Would you come and heal her? And so the crowd would not have been surprised when Jesus said, of course, because Jairus was pretty prominent and a religious leader. So, so he be, Jesus begins to follow Jairus to Jairus' home to heal his daughter. And the crowd begins to follow us because they're following the signs and the wonders. Well, in that same crowd that day, there was, there was another person with no prominence, right? No social standing. And she was only known. She, she, wasn't even, she didn't even have a name in scripture. She was only known by her issue, her problem. And, and we see this story in Mark chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 5. And this is what it says about this woman. It says that the woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years of constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. But she had heard about Jesus. So she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. And immediately, it says, the bleeding stopped. I love this story. You know, when we were in Israel a few years back, um, we were in this village called Magdala. And Magdala is this village that, that is completely dedicated to the value that Jesus placed on women. And it's where Mary Magdalene was from. And then there was a, a chapel. And in this chapel, when I walked into this chapel, um, this picture on the wall absolutely took my breath away. And this picture was so beautiful because you see, the first thing that, that caught my attention was that, is that this person, you don't even see her face because in the crowd that day, this woman would have, would have been unseen, right? The, the crowd would have, she would have, she would have been considered uninvited and, and unclean. And you can't see the, the woman's face because nobody would have even noticed her that day. And most versions of, of this story in the Bible, actually, they entitled this section, The Woman with the Issue of Blood, because she'd been hemorrhaging for 12 years, and under Levitical law, she would have had to remain isolated, away from family. And if she had children or a husband, she wouldn't have been able to be in any contact with, with them. But most likely, she didn't have a family. She wasn't able to have family dinners. Let that sink in. Family dinners, no celebrations completely isolated. She couldn't even go to the synagogue with her church family to celebrate the feast like everybody else could. And because of this condition, this issue, it left her completely isolated. But this issue and her problem actually became her identity. And I wonder if you've ever had a problem or an issue like that, a, a problem that actually consumed every area of your life. It impacted the way that you, you see yourself and maybe even the way other people see you. It, maybe it's an issue of an abuse that, that you experienced in your past and it's impacted every relationship. Or the issue of divorce that you feel like it's left you marked or the issue of depression or a diagnosis that's left you feeling a little bit limited. Maybe it's the, uh, the issue of rejection that, that someone walked away and left you feeling less than. And like this woman, you, know, you, you thought that maybe time could heal, but time is no healer. 
And in this story, this woman finds that, that there's someone, even though time is not a healer, there, there is someone that, that can heal. And his name is Jesus. And she heard his name and she knew that, that if she could just get to him, that even though time was not the healer, that maybe, just maybe, he could be the one that heals. So this woman, she, she decides that she's gonna reach out and touch him. And, and actually she has so much respect for him that, that she doesn't even wanna touch him. She touches the robe that touches him. See, she knows that, that by touching him, she could make him unclean. So, so she, if I could just touch what touches him. And then it says in verse 29, it says that immediately the bleeding stopped. And, and this would be just such a great ending of a miracle story, right? She got her miracle. And immediately the power leaves his, his, the power leaves his body and, and she's completely healed physically. But for Jesus, it wasn't enough for this woman just to experience his healing power. You know, when I, when I asked in the, um, in, in the chapel, I was asking, if you wanna put that picture up again, the, I was asking them, what is the name of this picture? Because I wanna get a print of this in my home. And, and I, I, I was wondering what the name was, and, and you would think maybe the name of this picture might be um, a great healing or a miracle story. But the name of this picture is the encounter, the encounter. And I love this because for Jesus, it wasn't enough just to heal her. He wanted her to encounter him. And that word encounter actually means this face-to-face -face meeting. It's, it's more than event, an event. It's more than an experience. When you have an encounter, there's a before and an after. There, an encounter is something that marks you and changes you, not, not just for a moment, but for a lifetime. And I, I love this quote that, um, that your pastor said when he preached his miracle series, that Jesus, he's more than a cosmic healer, passing out miracles and making dreams come true. Jesus is the king who invites his people to a spiritual kingdom. And, and I love this because, because this healing, this sign, was really just an invitation for, for this woman to encounter his presence, to encounter him in a way that would, that would mark every area of her life. So Jesus, because he was, he was not satisfied with just being a means to an end, because Jesus never is, he's not the means to an end, is, he's not satisfied, so he begins to ask his disciples the question, who touched me? And they're like, are you crazy? Everybody's touching you. The whole crowd's pressing in on you. What do you mean, who touched you? But, but he doesn't stop, and he, he continues to look around, and he says that, it says that Jesus kept on looking around to see who had done it. And then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, she came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. See, she was trembling with fear because she had every reason to be afraid. Because according to the law, she, she could have been punished because she had put Jesus and other people at risk. So you can imagine the fear that she had in that moment when she was gonna be, when, when she was gonna be exposed. But all those fears are dispelled as soon as Jesus begins to speak over her. And he says, he says to her, daughter, I, I just have to stop right there because that word daughter, there's so much in that, in that word, daughter, this is not, this is an identity word. See, this is the only time in scripture that Jesus called somebody daughter. He called somebody else a daughter of Abraham, but, but he's saying daughter, that word says so much. He wanted her to know that daughter, you are not your issue. And somebody needs to hear that tonight. You are not your issue. You're not an outsider. You're, you're not an outsider, you're, you're not an outcast, you matter. You matter to me is what Jesus was saying. And, and even though these crowds are pressing in and, and they're, they're following me so they can help see me heal the loved daughter of Jairus, you are now my loved daughter and you're worth stopping for. And as my daughter, you have access to everything. You have access to everything that I have, everything that I am. You have access to my healing, my power, my love. You have access to me. See, this, the word daughter is actually this identity word. He's telling her who she is. And, and I love this because he says, daughter, your, your faith has made you whole. But in verse 32, it says that, that she told him the whole truth. When she told him the whole truth, then she was made whole. She told him the whole truth. And that had to have taken a while 
Because remember, she had been in social isolation for about 12 years. Like if I am away from my husband for 12 hours and he comes home and wants to hear the, how my day went, I want to tell him the whole story. And that's going to take a long time, right? That's 12 hours. But how many of you know there's, there's a difference between the truth and the whole truth, right? The truth and the whole truth. When I was in the sixth grade, I went to a slumber party. And when I came home, my mom said, how was the slumber party? And I was like, it was amazing. We stayed up really late, and I had the best time. Well, that was the truth, but that was not the whole truth. What I didn't tell her was that we went outside at 2 in the morning. We were knocking at people's doors and running away. And then the police came, and they took all of our names. And even though I had recited a fake name to give them just in case I got caught, I got nervous, gave them my real name and my address. So for the next two weeks, I thought every time I saw a police car that I was going to be arrested. That was the whole story, right? So there's a difference between the truth and the whole truth. And I think, you know, sometimes that, that we, we sometimes give Jesus just part of the truth. We, we give him our half-truth. And I love this because in the story, he says, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. And this word peace actually means shalom. It doesn't mean just like peace out. It means shalom, that, that, that Hebrew word, that the depth of that word, that it means to be made whole, nothing missing, nothing broken. See, when she told Jesus the whole truth is when she was made whole. See, he could only redeem what she revealed and released. And, and the, the deal was is that he didn't want her to carry the residue of, of what 12 years of isolation could have done to her. She, she, he didn't want her to, to just, he didn't want to just heal her body. He wanted to heal her emotions, right? And he didn't want to carry the regret. And he knew that, that, that it was going to take more than just a quick hit to heal all of that. And so I think a lot of times that, that when, when he didn't want to heal her body, he wanted to make her completely whole when she revealed the whole truth. And I think a lot of times we just like, we give Jesus the half, half our story. And, and we, we give them half the truth. It's like, Jesus, would you just bless this relationship I'm in? I mean, I know he is the one. Just bless us, Jesus. And you're, but you ignore what the word of God says about purity and relationships. Or we, we pray, God, would you heal my broken heart from my past hurts? But I'm going to carry this bitterness. Just a little bit. This bitterness and unforgiveness has, has become like my, my companion and, and we want him to, to, to bless part of our story, but he can, only, he can only heal what's revealed. And sometimes we have to, to reveal the, the whole story. And this is what happened. We wonder why many times when we only give him half the story, why we're inconsistent and weak. He can only redeem what we reveal. It's when we give the whole story that we're made whole. Nothing missing, nothing broken. And this is what his plan is for you, daughters of the king, that there would be nothing missing, nothing broken. But I love how the story goes on because he didn't just stop for her, right, so that she would know that she was a daughter of the king. But he did this in a very public way. Like everybody was watching and, and, and you can't, there's nothing wasted on the fact that they were going to, to he was going to heal a, a loved daughter who was 12 years old, the exact amount of time that she had been suffering with this condition, nothing was wasted in this moment. He's, he's captivating an audience. He not only wants her to know, but he wants everyone to know. And he wants her to know that he wants everybody to know. He, he's like, she's with me. This is, this is my daughter, she's with me, and I, I know that, that, you, that you're hanging with me to, so that you can see the, the signs and wonders and miracles, but, but he was establishing the spiritual family. He was saying that, that you can't say you love me and reject her. See, this is how spiritual family works. And see, Jesus wanted her to know, wanted everyone to know that I'm not just healing you, your body, but, but I am, I'm restoring some territory that's been lost over the last 12 years, the, the territory of spiritual community. He was giving her this, this place of honor in his family. See, the miracle that, that she got was not the one that she was looking for. He, he wanted to not only make her physically whole, emotionally whole, but also spiritually and relationally whole. By giving her this new place in, in a spiritual family, he was actually setting her up for future victory. He, he was saying, I'm not going to be here in the flesh to answer your next prayer, but I'm setting you up in a spiritual family 
so that you can be set up for future victory. He, he wasn't just, if, if she had just settled for, for the quick miracle, then she would have missed his majesty, the encounter with the spirit of the living God and the inheritance of being a part of a spiritual family. And do you know that, that for you, that the spiritual family that you belong to is, this, is, is, the, is the plan that God put in place for your victory, the plan that God put in place for, for your healing, that, that there are so many pre-answered prayers in this place. Lord, just help me to know what to do with my kids. How am I, how am I gonna raise teenagers in this culture? Well, did you know that in this church you have an amazing student ministry called Elevate, right? That they're gonna echo God's voice over your kids' lives. It's a pre-answered prayer. He's already answered that prayer. God, help me in my marriage. I, I pray, God, I don't know what to do in my marriage. Did you know that there are people in this place that have been down roads that, that you haven't been down? And, and he's established spiritual family for your victory. And it's part of your inheritance. And what he was saying to this woman is, I'm going to set you up in a spiritual family so you have nothing missing and nothing broken. That, that not only am I going to bring healing to every part of your life, but I'm going to establish a, a, a system in which the body of Christ in which is going to give you what you need for the future victory that I have for you. And so many times we, we settle for the quick experience and, and we miss out on the encounter that, and, and all of what God wants to give us when we encounter him. And you know, I was, I was thinking about this whole idea of just nothing missing, nothing broken. And that's, that's what the inheritance that he has for us as his daughters, that, that's the inheritance that we have when, when he places the crown on our head. And I thought, you know, there's really no reason. Like, we, 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 we know that when we came in tonight, this isn't just an event. It's not just a, a worship experience where we're gonna get a few goosebumps and, and, and leave feeling really good. This is an encounter with the spirit of the living God. And there's really no reason for us to, to leave the same way that we came in. There's, there's no reason for us to leave consumed by the distractions and the wrath that the enemy wants to throw our way to, to keep us living small, limited lives. And I just started thinking about the scripture, remember in Psalm 8 where it says that he crowns you with glory and honor. And I was thinking, you know, the one who deserves all the glory and all the honor, he created you like him and he crowns you with his glory. And this crown that... that that I want you to envision for yourself is, is this crown that comes with privilege. I've been talking about it. It comes with territory. It comes with access. I mean, there's some places that royalty can go that we just can't go, right? And the same way as daughters of the king, there, we have access to, firsthand access to the king of kings himself. We can, we can walk with authority. We can claim victory. But the crown also comes with a responsibility, you know, when, when Queen Elizabeth, up until the day she died, the crown that she wore on her head weighed five pounds. Could you imagine walking around every day with a five-pound bag of sugar on your head, right? And I think that, that the crown was weighty so that, that she would remember the weight and the responsibility that comes when, we are, when she was a, a queen. When you, when, you, when you wear the crown, there is a responsibility that, that comes with it. And, and I just wanted to give a challenge. And I feel like the Lord just gave me a word and a challenge for, for everyone, every woman in this room, the ones that would step up and wear the crown, to walk out a little bit different than how we walked in. And, and I was thinking, you know, again, it'd be a shame for us to leave the same way that we came in. And I thought it might be great if maybe we could have like our own personal coronation ceremony, right? So, so the coronation ceremony, again, is, is that moment when you when you step up to be who you were born to be in the first place. And so I feel like the Lord's given me a word for you, and, um, and I'm, not gonna, um, I'm, I'm not gonna ask everyone to stand. I might ask some of you to stand. But, um, but you'll know who I'm talking to when, when, I, when, I, when I begin to, to give the challenge and the word. And I, I really believe that if, if God honors us, how much more in this moment should, should we honor each other? And I, I want to, to, to call out and honor some people in the room. And so this is like the, I wish I could have brought a crown for everyone, but um, that wouldn't have fit in my suitcase, and it probably wasn't in the budget for a summer splash. But I just want you to just sit up a little taller and, and receive the crown. And the first, first group of people that I want to talk to is um, if you're here tonight and you have some years of experience, right? You, you might have some kids, 
some grandkids or spiritual grandkids, you, you're seasoned. You are not old. You are vintage, right? <laughs> I want you to sit up taller because I have a word for you. I want to honor you. And we, the sisterhood of this house, we want to honor you because you have been resilient. When life tried to knock you down, you got right back up. You stayed planted in the house of the Lord. You, you, have, you look back and so many times you see the mistakes that you've made, but your mistakes do not make you and that is not how God sees you. He says that your best and your brightest days are in front of you. And I wanna read a scripture, Psalm 65, 11 says this. It says that, that he wants to crown this year, this season, with his goodness. That word goodness is the word tov. It means, it means full, that which fulfills purpose. That in these days, in this season, you have purpose. You have calling on your life. And that, that, that it says that even the hard pathways will overflow with abundance. The places that have caused you the most pain are going to be the seeds of wisdom and the seeds of impartation that are going to be, that are going to be somebody else's, the seed of, to somebody else's miracle. There are spiritual children and grandchildren that need you, that even your hard pathways are going to overflow with abundance. But let me just give you a challenge. In this season, this is not the season to stay home and sit on your throne, figuratively or physically, right? This, this is not that season. You're, you're, the daughters of this house need you. They need your wisdom, they need your strength, they need your impartation, and we honor you today because you have so much more to give, and we honor you for the purpose and potential that you're going to fulfill in the coming days. Can you honor all of the vintage ladies of the house? So my, um, all my Elevate girls, right? Elevate girls, middle school, high school, college. I want you to stand to your feet. All the, I want you to stand to your, oh, come on. Yeah. Okay. Wow. We honor you. You have been created with so much purpose and potential. Acts chapter 2 says that in these days, he is pouring out his spirit that his sons and his daughters are going to prophesy. They're going to prophesy and testify hope to a generation that is losing hope right now. And what I want you to hear is that, that this woman, for her to, to be able to receive the miracle, the encounter that Jesus had for her, she, had to, she could not allow the crowd to obstruct her view or block her path. See, there's always going to be a crowd that's going to try to keep you from the places where God has prepared for you for a spirit to move in your life to mark you. The crowd is gonna, is gonna tell you that, that you, you don't fit in. You're crazy for being at church this many days a week, right? The, the crowd also called this woman an outcast. The crowd's gonna tell you that you don't fit in. It's gonna try to convince you that, that this word is outdated and antiquated. But what I want you to hear is that the crowd did not form you in your mother's womb with so much purpose and potential. The crowd did not die on the cross for your sins and impart his spirit in you. Jesus did that. And see, the, the crowd will tell you that, that you can do whatever you want, when you want, with whoever you want, with, with your body. But your body is actually the residence, the temple, the house of the Holy Spirit of the living God. And you are not a mistake, you are a masterpiece. And there's gonna come a time when you're gonna have to make a decision about what you're gonna do with this body. And I wanna challenge you that, that when you have to choose between the way of the world and the way of the crown, that you would stand up when everybody else is bowing down, stand up and honor the one who has honored you with his presence, with his purpose, with his spirit that has so much calling and potential over you, that, that he's crowned you with honor and glory. Honor the one who has honored you with his purpose and that you would know that there is nothing, nothing that you can do. You can't earn the crown, but you have to value the crown. The crown must be valued. 
Now, you may have, you may have, may have, have walked in tonight. You may have made some mistakes. You don't have to walk out with any shame or guilt that you can hold your head up high because he has anointed you, he has appointed you, and as you walk out tonight, you can walk out worthy of the crown. And we're gonna cheer you on every step of the way. Let's honor our sisters today. You can have a seat. Some of you, 20s, 30s, 40s, you're doing hard things every single day. You're, you're, some of you are single and you're waiting for God, you're faithful waiting for God to answer your prayers. Some of you are changing diapers, you're caring for aging parents, you're doing hard things, raising kids in a, a generation that the culture is pulling them in the opposite direction. And there are times that you may feel overlooked and hidden, and you're wondering if what you're doing matters. There are times when, when you're wondering if, 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 the, if, if the, the hiddenness that you're being overlooked, if it even matters. And what I want you to know is that God sees you, he sees you, and he says that you are a kingdom carrier. And when you carry his presence and you carry his kingdom into the mundane, you are actually, you're actually planting seeds for, for future miracles, miracles in your own life and miracles in the lives that you're investing in right now. And, and he, he wants you to know that, that don't give up now. Don't give up now. Be faithful. Stay true. But the challenge is, is that you don't want to cheapen your crown by comparing it to somebody else's. Because this is what happens when we compare our crown to somebody else. <laughs> yeah, may this never be said of us, right? This actually happened. There was a, a first runner-up who thought she deserved to win. And so this is what happens when, when, when somebody want, thinks they, they deserve something that somebody else gets and they take it for themselves. It gets a little bit ugly. And what I want you to hear is that I really believe that competition and comparison and cancel culture have actually become tools in the enemy's hand to, to take us out, to keep us isolated from each other. Because the enemy knows that the only battle that you can't win is the one that you try to fight on your own. And so as, as sisters, are, we have to fight for each other, that the words we speak to each other and about each other, they can set someone up or they can take someone out. And that when you speak, that you would understand that the words you speak need to be worthy of the crown that you wear and the kingdom that you represent. And that you recognize that, that your, her victory is your victory. And that, that the enemy will try to keep us isolated, keep us apart, because he knows that if he can keep us separated, that he can take us out. So being committed to each other to, to claim victory, that we were made for this. We were made for victory, but we were made to fight for each other. You know, when I, when I think about um, the encounter, especially that picture that I was showing you earlier, I, I was thinking about the fact that, um, that in that day, that, that day when Jesus was there, there was a whole crowd of people. There were hundreds of people that day, but only one got a miracle. And there were a lot of people touching Jesus, but there's a difference between touching Jesus and reaching for Jesus. See, the, the one who got the miracle was the one who reached. The one who reached received all that Jesus had for her. And I really believe that, that there's a, a reach that needs to happen if we're going to walk out different and changed and marked by an encounter with the, with the spirit of the living God, that there's a reach that needs to happen. And when I was thinking about this, reaching, it's actually is a little, you have to stretch, right? And stretching can get a little bit uncomfortable. So you can't reach and hold on at the same time. See, I really believe that, that God wants to place some things in your hand, but if you're holding on, he can't place that new thing in your hand if you're holding on to the old thing. And to reach means to stretch. And I know that it can be uncomfortable to stretch. So I just want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And, and the reason I, we do this is so that, um, so that you can just turn off the distractions, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Because I believe that the Holy Spirit is speaking tonight. And, and he's calling some of us to, to reach, to get a little bit uncomfortable. And it's going to be uncomfortable to leave a crowd, to walk away from a crowd that's keeping you from your calling. But I believe for some of you, that's what the Holy Spirit is saying to do. And, and I, I just want you to listen to the Holy Spirit of what he wants you to do with this message. There's a crowd to walk away from. Maybe it's, a, it's time to, to release the whole story. 
to release the bitterness, the unforgiveness. Maybe there's a part of your story that you've never told anyone and it's time to, to share that part of your story and get the help that you need. Talk to a pastor, bring someone along for, to pray. Maybe there's some territory, territory in your mind and your emotions that, that the enemies laid claim to and tonight you know that you want it. it's time to take that territory back. Maybe some territory in your family, whatever it is that I really believe tonight that, that as we walk out of here, heads held high, carrying the, the privilege and the responsibility. Some of you is calling you to a new level of responsibility. He wants, he wants to give you some territory of influence and leadership, but it's gonna require that, that you get more consistent in your time with the Lord, get more consistent in prayer. He's wanting to put something in your hand, but he hasn't been able to do it yet because, because your character can't, can't carry the weight that he's ready to give you. Whatever that is, I just want you to just, in your, in your heart right now, just make that commitment. Make that commitment of whatever it is, Lord. There's nothing that's gonna keep me from living a life worthy of the crown. So Father God, I just thank you for your daughters. I thank you that tonight I believe that, that there is some joy that's gonna be restored, strength renewed, faith that's, that's, been, that's been set aflame, God, and, and, and the, the callings are gonna be released tonight because we walk worthy of the crown. I pray, God, that, that you would help every daughter in this place to, to not only just walk out of this event feeling good, but walk out ready to make the change that is going to allow her to walk a life worthy of the privilege and the responsibility that she carries with the crown of being a daughter of the king. We thank you, Jesus, King Jesus, for, for victory is yours. We thank you that, that when, we, when, we, when, we, when we identify as your daughter, that, there is, that we don't have to fight from a place for victory, but it's a place of victory. You are our victor. We are claiming victory over this place, over your daughters tonight. And God, I pray that you would just anoint them as they walk out tonight, that there would be a difference, that it would be a marked change. There would be a before and an after. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, I know there's some of you here that maybe you came with a friend and, and you've never actually stepped into a relationship with Jesus. And I want you to know that he loves you. He, he is calling you by name. And if you feel like your, your heart maybe is beating, that's him, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And, and he wants a relationship with you. But he, he wants to give you everything. He wants you to give you his love, his grace, his healing, freedom that's available when you're a daughter of the king. If that's you, if you've never had a relationship with Jesus, or maybe you, you've been, had a relationship, but you know it's not where it should be, and you want to restart that relationship. If that's you, if you want to start or restart a relationship, I want to pray for you. And if you would just put your hand in the air, so I know who you are, front to the back, put your hand in the air, you want to start or restart a relationship. Yeah, I see those hands. Thank you. It's brave. It's the one who reaches receives. We're going to pray a prayer, and I'm going to have everybody pray after me, but you're going to pray it just a little bit louder because this is your prayer. So let's pray this together. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me just the way I am. Tonight, I want to be your daughter. I want to be a Christian. Change me from the inside out. Forgive me in my sin. Make me a new person. And from this day forward, I will live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.